is Fuzzy your real name? Fuzzy? No, no, that's my, that's a name my mom gave to me. I, she said she raised the cover back and my hair was standing up and she said, Fuzzy. And, and it kind of stuck with me all through these years, so. What's your real name? Charles, Charles Lee, L-E-E. -E. And, you know, that's kind of weird because my mom's maiden name was L-E-A, Lee. But they named me L-E-E, -E, Charles Lee Owen. O-W-E, and no S on the end. Uh, Buck Owen's got a bunch of relatives. I only got me. <laughs> <laughs> um, where did you grow up? Um, and I don't know if I ever grew up, but I, ca I was growing a lot in, in uh, Conway, Arkansas. Uh, we lived in a place uh, called uh, Bologna, Arkansas. That's, that's where I was born. Then we moved to a place called Squirrel Hill. And that was a, a service station without the gas pumps. But we did, we did have candy and stuff in the store. My dad sold some of them. And then we moved on into Conway, but um, Conway, I guess, is, is where I grew up, yeah. When did you come to Bakersfield? I came to Bakersfield. <clears throat> I was uh, 17 years old, and I believe that was 46, 46, 47. Uh, I, uh, I had a lot of relatives here in Bakersfield, uh, aunts, uncles, and, you know, whatnot. And uh, so they kept, kept telling me the music business was better. Arkansas, at that time, the music business was bad. I mean, there wasn't no music business, to be honest with you. Uh, there wasn't no, there was only nightclubs and that was 30 miles away and one or two little nightclubs. But um, Arkansas at that time wasn't really hot from country music, so I figured I'd rather better come to Bakersfield. At least it couldn't be no worse. And sure enough, it was hot here in Bakersfield, yeah. When did you get in the music industry? When did I get in the music industry? Or when did you get into music? Did you know you wanted to play or be a part of it? Well, you know, it's hard to say exactly, but I kind of um, had a hankering to get in it uh, when I was a probably about 13, 14 years old. Uh, my dad had a, a, a garage and uh, he also sold used cars. So uh, he, uh, he took a guitar in on trade on one of the gold cars. And uh, I started picking around on that and uh, I got interested in the music. I like Bob Wills and, you know, Hank Thompson and all those big band people and, and Hank Williams and I liked them all. And um, the song Corina with Bob Wills was my favorite at that time. Of course, I've ch it's changed since then, but anyway, I got interested in it. And there was a couple of guys there, uh, one guy could play the fiddle a little, and uh, another guy could play guitar. So I liked the sound of a steel guitar. I didn't have a steel guitar. I had a regular guitar, and I um, put a nut up at the end of the, gu the guitar neck and raised the strings off of the neck, if you know. And that way you could rub a bar and it wouldn't be rubbing on the neck, it, it, you know. And so that was my steel guitar at first. And I had a wrist pin out of a Model A Ford for the bar, kind of primitive, but uh, I was interested in it. And so my older brother, he, um, Finally, he bought me a six-string Gibson guitar. He helped me, helped me get one. So I, I practiced on the steel guitar, you know. 
and I came to California with a, a, a well, he played drums and the bass, and we came to California. I went to work for Tiny's Waffle Shop. Down on Chester, I was the bus boy. Uh, I, um, my buddy and his, and his wife came out with me, and he got a job at the Sad Sack. Now the Sad Sack, uh, prostitution on top, and a beer joint on the bottom. And I, I'm 17, and he's 17. So the guy hired us to play in the band, and we had a George French on the accordion. And uh, when the cops would come out, we'd have to go out the window, you know, and because we're underage, and they'd sell in beer and stuff. But that was the first playing job, uh, music that I had, was Side Sack. It's out on Edison Highway there. When did your music career kind of take off in Bakersfield? Uh, I think the Cousin Herb show, when I went on the Cousin Herb show, I had, um, well, I played the Clover Club to 1951, and my mom wrote me a letter and said they're going to call you in the Army. So in 1950, a few days before 51, I quit my job and went to Arkansas and went in the Army in Conway so I'd be close to home. So I went to Camp Chaffee, Arkansas, and did my basic training and everything. And I was in there two years. They had me in Korea in three months. I was over there. On, and um, I tried to get in the special service so I could play instead of go over there. But And I was in there until, uh, uh, I'd say, a year and eight or 10 months. And they let me out a little bit early because I wouldn't sign up again. They, uh, they wanted me to sign up. They wanted to make me a second lieutenant. And I said, no, <laughs> I'm going to go into music business. And so anyway, I, uh, I was a sergeant at the time. And, uh, and I said, no, I, I'm going to turn it down. I don't want to sign back up. So, so I came back, and the guy at the Clover Club hired me back. He, I said, uh, you know, I'd like to have a job back. He said, come on, we're ready, won't you? I think they was kind of tired of the band they had. I don't know. But anyway, I went right back to the Clover Club in 51. And in 53, I went, uh, went in on the Cousin Herb show. Uh, and that's where I met Bonnie Owens. Uh, Bonnie was working in, I understand she was working in, in a drive-in, and uh, the guy that owned the Clover Club, they'd go there to the drive-in and Bonnie would wait on them, and they liked Bonnie, so they talked her into coming to the Clover Club and being a cocktail waitress. And I don't know if you want to hear all this stuff. Yeah, do, yeah. do you? Okay. And so that's where I met Bonnie Owens. And I stayed there and played that thing for, what, 10 years, I guess, until Herb died. I was on the Cousin Herb show. Um, then the drummer, Glenn Ayers, he knew someone in, in Fairbanks, Alaska. So the guy in Fairbanks wanted to hire us as a band. So at that time, I had a 51 Ford Victoria that I bought from my dad. My dad bought a new car, new Ford every year. And when I was in the Army, I wrote my mom and, and told him not to sell his last car, not to trade it in, go ahead and buy him a new car, and I would pay him whatever he, uh, he could get out of his old car. I wanted to keep his old car. 
because he was real gentle with the car. I mean, he didn't wear it out. He didn't even break it in good with it. But anyway, so I had a 51 Ford Victoria, and we drove that thing to Alaska. Well, on the way up there, the guy that hired us died. He passed away. So we got to Fairbanks, Alaska. We didn't have a job. <laughs> now, in Fairbanks, Alaska, at that time, silver dollars. Do you want to hear all this? Yeah. And Fairbanks, Alaska, uh, they operated with uh, silver dollars. Like Vegas had silver dollars for a while, and they finally figured out they was worth more than a dollar. So they got rid of them and made their own chips. Anyway, Fairbanks, Alaska, they had a couple of nightclubs and they put the bandstand behind the bar stools, behind the bar. So we played a couple of nights and we had a wash tub, number two wash tub. People would throw silver dollars in there. So we made a little bit of money and headed back to Bakersfield. <laughs> uh, but uh, that was kind of a long trip. There's about, but on the way out, I, I don't know, uh, my old car broke a rear axle. Now that's uncommon, I don't know why, but the roads were gravel and the trees and stuff, it was wilderness all the way up there. And the only time you see the sky is when you look straight up because the trees and things were so big. I remember that. And uh, 400 miles out of Fairbanks, uh, I broke an axle, in, in a rear axle, you know, in a, in a car, which was so uncommon. I've never figured out why it broke. The only thing I can figure is the gravel and the vibration and stuff was so bad for so long, and it finally broke uh, an axle. And so a guy in Fairbanks, the guy that, that Glenn Ayers knew, we called him and he found an axle and brought it out to us 400 miles from Fairbanks. Oh God. And so we went on to Fairbanks. We saw the place we were supposed to play, but it was closed. So we played a couple of nights and then turned around and come back to Bakersfield. And that's when I went on the Cousin Herb show. Uh, when you, how long did you play music for? How long? How long have I played music? Yeah. Till my hearing went bad, I picked around. But I quit playing. For a while I was managing Merle and the band and everything, trying to. And I was also playing the steel guitar in the band. And it finally got so, so big, I had, I had to quit one or two, so I quit playing and just went to managing. Merle wanted me to manage and we had an office. We had uh, Betty Azevedo uh, run the office and my oldest daughter worked in there for a while. Uh, yeah. Uh, How did you lose your hearing? The what? How did you lose your hearing? Um, I don't know. Uh, it just, it, I started getting dizzy. And this, this ear was good and this one was bad. But it ended up, this one went all the way down, and this one went down to 45%. I've only got 45% hearing in this ear, and I've been wearing a hearing aid. So I had to quit playing. What happens is uh, you get more fluid in one side and you do the other. And you get a, if you go e oh, so I'm out of tune. I mean, I'm, I'm playing somewhere in between, so I had to, had to quit playing steel for a while. But it finally settled down and I could still pick, but I, I gave that up and went to uh, managing, just managing the whole, whole outfit. What was it like managing Merle? B. 
busy. <laughs> it was a, uh, it was it was fun in a way, but it was work in a way too. Uh, if you love your job, then it's fun. You know, I like the job. Uh, I had a lot of confidence in Merle. I signed him uh, to a record company that I got that I owned at that time. Uh, my cousin Louis Talley started the record company, Talley Records, and I bought in with him, and we were partners. We built a couple of recording studios, and uh, Louis um, wanted to dial the business. He wanted to sell his house and everything. We had a studio in the back, so I traded my part of the studio for the record company and the publishing company. So I owned the record company and he had the studio so he could sell his house and he was getting a divorce. I don't want to go into that. That's right. uh, he, he wanted to get a divorce and the only way he could sell a house, I owned a part of that studio. Mm -hmm. So I traded that for the Tally Records. Uh, I was a partner, but then I became sole owner of the Tally Records. At that time, I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I said, okay, you know. So. <clears throat> what, uh, what songs did Merle record for Tally Records? Well, first of all, uh, in uh, 40, uh, let's see, well, uh, I'm trying to think. It was probably. 50 something. Merle, uh, Merle made a dub. You know what dubs are? Mm -hmm. Okay. Merle made a, a dub in, in our studio. We had a studio down on East Bakersfield, Chester there. And Merle made a dub. I wasn't there at the time, but Louie recorded him. And he played it for me, and he wanted to know if we wanted to sign him. I said, and that Merle was trying too hard, I guess. He he sounded like Buck Owens. And I said, well, we don't need another Buck Owens. You know? I mean, he was a good imitator. I mean, that that eventually became part of his show. He, he did imitation. But anyway, I said, no. So Merle went in the, in the joint. You know what the joint is? Reform school. Oh, yeah, yeah. He went to reform school for two years. So uh, we were on Sundays, let me put it this way. We played six nights a week and twice on Sunday. We had a jam session on Sunday. That means that the First band plays five hours, and then they leave, and the other band comes on. Well, the other band was Jelly Sanders, and Merle was in that band at this time. Most of the time, uh, I would just saddle up my guitar and everything and, and leave. But today, after I lingered, I went to the back and was talking to Johnny Barnett, and Merle sang a song. I said, whoa, that's the best damn singing I ever heard. And so Merle came off the stage, and I told him that. I said, Merle, that's the best damn singing I ever heard. He said, well, why don't you sign me up? I said, I will. I said, that's a good deal. The only thing we have to do now is find a song. I said, let's find a song we'll record. That's how we got together. So Merle was working in uh, Vegas with Wynn Stewart, playing the bass, I think, for him. And he called me up and he said, I found a song. Uh, he said, I said, well, what's the name of it? He said, sing a sad song. I said, I'll tell you what, meet me in Hollywood and bring the band with you. And I said, meet me at Norm's Cafe down there on Sunset, and we'll record it. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, people can't believe that, but 
That's the way I signed him. I've never had a contract with Merle. It's always a handshake. And so we met down there and we did this song, sang a sad song. And uh, I took it to different people and they, uh, I took it to Ken Nelson, he turned it down. And <laughs> what's funny, well, not funny, but what's kind of uh, weird is that same song, uh, Cousin Herb did a capital jam session, I call it. Glenn Campbell was on it, Roy Clark, uh, God, I don't know who all was on there and Cousin Herb, but Capitol Records was doing that here in Bakersfield. Well, Merle was on that show. In fact, I was playing the steel on the thing for, with Cousin Herb. And he did that same song, sang a sad song. And Ken said, I want to sign that guy. But I had played him the record and he turned it down. See. Well, anyway. Uh, he probably had so many people on his mind, you know, he, he couldn't, didn't, but he didn't remember hearing Merle sing. Anyway, he wanted to sign Merle to the capital contract. So that's what happened. Uh, uh, Merle went down, I think, he went down and talked to Ken but he didn't sign. Now, when we was in Norm's in Hollywood, uh, the only thing I ever advised Merle on at that time was, I said, Merle, we're gonna do this record. And I said, people will be calling you, wanting you to sign with them. But I said, don't sign with them because they only give you 2% of 90%. That's what they wanna sign you up for at first. And, and I said, we'll get 6%. Just don't sign with them. And you know, that's exactly what happened. Ken, Merle went down and talked to Ken Nelson at Capitol. And Ken wanted to sign him, and he didn't sign. He come back and told me, he said, Ken wants to sign me, so you better go down and talk to him. So I went down and talked to Ken, and we made a deal. I had half of an album already finished. So uh, we made a deal. I said, okay, we'll sign up with you. And uh, that's how he got on Capitol Records. So. Is that crazy that they would only get that small of a percentage of their? That's what they try to do. Uh, I don't know if I should be telling all their secrets or not, but but what Capital did, they give you 2% of 90%. That means 10% breakage. They figure like 10% will be breakage. So they don't have to pay you on every album, only 90% of the albums that they sell are, are the records. So I don't know if people are interested in all this stuff or not, but. Uh, it was a diff it's a sneaky business kind of. A what? It's a little bit of a sneaky business. A little tricky. Well, I tell you, every business isn't like that. Really. They've all we don't know the whole story about all all those businesses out there. But uh, anyway that's that was the deal. What um what was your what's your favorite song now? Right now? God, I haven't really thought about it. Uh, I always say that the most important song was probably Swinging Doors. And the reason for that, because I'd run out of money doing all that stuff. And that was the first record with Capitol. And it went, it went to number two and so uh, it's like that first record, Merle was in, still in Vegas, and I had this 
uh, I wanted to put violins on Merle sang a sad song. It didn't have violins on it. And he called and he wanted to uh, know if I could send him some money. I said, well, if I do, it'll be two more weeks before I can get your record out. And so he said, okay, forget it. Anyway, I, uh, I had a guy to write out the, the violin parts and I put violins on that first record, uh, sang a sad song. I, but I had run out of money. Uh, I was financing the whole thing, paying the musicians and all that stuff. Uh, anyway. Was it hard back then to make it work in the music? Oh. Was it hard to make music back then? No, it wasn't hard to make music, it was just hard to make it successful. Yeah, uh, there was uh, like four or five nightclubs going here in Bakersfield at the same time. But you know, we, we was a little bit different. Uh, now in Nashville, I don't know if you want to hear about Nashville, but they have a clique. Most, most countries do. But in Bakersfield, we worked together. We did, um, Bill Woods played the Blackboard and I played the Clover Club. Uh, Bill Woods and me, we, we recorded on Gene Shepard's Dear John Letter. Now, Bonnie Owens and I had the first record on Dear, a Dear John Letter. Hillbilly Barton was here in town and we recorded it for his label. That was before I had Tally Records, it was in 53. Uh, Bonnie and I recorded a Dear John Letter in Ed Smyzer's studio, a little old studio here in Bakerfield. And we only had one microphone and anyway, that was the first record of a Dear John Letter. What was your, did you stay friends with Bonnie, obviously, because you were, you were good friends with Bonnie? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we were good friends. Uh, Bonnie was a fine lady, fine woman. She went to work uh, this, at the Clover Club when I came out of the Army. She was working there. That's how I met her. Yeah. And... Uh, Hillbilly Barton wanted Bonnie and I, we were on the Cousin Herb show together. We did a lot of duets together on the Cousin Herb show. And so Hillbilly heard us on Cousin Herb show, wanted us to do his song, A Dear John Letter. Now, what's really funny or ironic or out of the ordinary is that Lewis Tiley traded 38 Kaiser for that song. A Dear John Letter, he traded his Kaiser for that song, and I bought half of his Kaiser for $200. So him and I were partners in Tyler Records, and that's how Tyler Records started. That's kind of weird, but. Um, did you, how did you get on the Cousin Herb show? I got in her about, he called me up. Okay, I'll tell you the connection. Cousin Herb was living in the house with my aunt. Now, Cousin Herb, before the Cousin Herb show, he had a van. And what he would do, he would go around and pick up people's cleaning and take it to the cleaners and then deliver them back. And that's how he was making his living. And then he got on the Cousin Herb show, uh, uh, got on the TV and then called it the Cousin Herb show. And uh, Billy Myers was on there. I, I never didn't know why Billy wasn't on the show, but he was on there for about a year, I think. And then when I got back from Alaska, and went to work at the Clover Club. He, uh, he was living with my aunt, so he knew I played steel. He needed a steel player, so he called me and wanted me to go to work for him, so I did. 
And also he wanted Bonnie. So he hired Bonnie too at the same time. And uh, we was on there till he passed away in 63. What was your, what's been your favorite moment in your musical career? Oh boy, I've had a lot of good moments. Oh, uh, I can't think of any particular one right off. But I guess, <clears throat> I guess um, the fact that Ken Nelson would put, put Merle on Capitol Records because I was in the business deep enough to know that without distribution, you can't make it in the record business, see. And Capitol's got their own dis distributors. I had distributors, but what would happen, I don't know if you want to hear this or not, but what would happen if, if you was a little small label and you had a hit song, distributors wouldn't pay you unless you had another one. See, they wouldn't pay you unless they had to, let's put it that way. And so you had to have two hits in order to get paid for the first hit. I mean, basically that's what would happen. I had distributors, but they wouldn't pay me. And so I was broke. And so I'm, I'm glad that Ken Nelson uh, wanted to sign Merle. That's one of my happiest moments, I guess. Was it great to see all of his success as an artist? Do what? Was it great to see Merle's success as an artist? You know, it was. Uh, you know, there's something for you. I thank God. Are you religious? Mm -hmm. I think God played a big part in that. I want to give him credit. I want to give God credit because so many things happened while we were on tour and stuff that were uncommon. You know, it was kind of uncommon. And I want to give God credit. I, I think God helped us a lot. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank God. What was Merle like? He's one of the boys. He's been to the penitentiary. He's robbed a liquor store in the daytime when he was drunk. And he drank a little bit. He was one of the guys. Uh, he was, he's a good guy. Yeah, he's a good man. Him and I, I guess we spent, no telling how much time, just fishing together on Lake Shasta. Well, in between tours, I used to leave here and go to Lake Shasta. I had a boat and we'd just stay out on that lake and fish. And, Merle finally um, bought a marina up there and a bunch of stuff went on. Uh, How long did you know him? How many years? Since 1962. Uh, I knew him from, from, from that first time I'm in the lucky spot when I said I'll sign you. That's when I knew him from then on. Uh, was he talented? 1962, yeah. Was he talented? When I first met him, he lived in a, with his mom in the box car. Uh, and they put it out here to, uh, at the, uh, what is it? The, the museum. At the museum. They moved his box car out there to the museum. And you know, we were talking one day and I, and I said, Merle, you know, you've heard a lot about the uh, uh, American dream. I said, you are the American dream. He went from the penitentiary. Uh, what he did, he, he got drunk and robbed a store in the daytime, <laughs> and they were still open, so he was pretty drunk. <laughs> anyway, he spent two years in the joint, and he went from that to number one. That is the American dream, from the bottom to the top. I mean, 
Merle Haggard is the American dream, really. What is it like to know that the Bakersfield sound kind of ended with your generation? Boy, you know, uh, the Bakersfield sound, let me tell you what it is. People don't know what it is. Uh, I'll tell you what I think the Bakersfield sound is. is Merle Haggard and Buck Owens. Of course, we had, actually Gene Shepard was kind of out of here, and we had Tommy Collins. Uh, we had, uh, I don't know, Ferland Husky was here for a while. That's how he got the uh, Dear John letter. Um, let, me, let me put it like this. Uh, if I played you a record without Merle Haggard on it, would you know where it come from? If I played you a, a record without Buck Owen on it, would you know where it come from? So what is the Bakersfield sound? Buck Owen and Merle Haggard. That's my interpretation of it. Now, other people, they say the Bakersfield sound. I will say, I will say that they're trying to, uh, they're comparing it with Nashville. Okay. To me, Bakersfield has a better sound, but that's still Buck Owen and Merle Haggard than they did in Nashville. Yeah. Am I making good sense? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, that's, that's all I can say about the Bakersfield sound. I think it's great. What was it like to be a part of the music that came out of here? It's great. It's wonderful. Uh, I will mention one other thing. When we first started, um, they tried to get us to move to Nashville, but we didn't. We didn't go for it. Uh, the Wilburn Brothers. I, have you ever heard of the Wilburn Brothers? Okay. They called us and wanted us to move to Nashville and get under their company and uh, let them do our bookings and all that stuff. We turned it down. We said, no, we'll stay in Bakersfield. And I'm so glad we did. I think, I think you're better off in, away from Nashville in a lot of ways. Not every way, but in a lot of ways. But Nashville is pretty much a click. You know what I mean by click? Uh, they have the same people on every record you hear. They have the same, you know, that basically they, they use the same people and doing the whole thing. And uh, Merle said one time, he lived in Nashville with Leona Williams when he was married to Leona. He lived out there for a while. He said that was the least productive time in his whole life. Uh, and uh, if you're not in the click, that's all I'll say. Okay. Um, when you think back on your career, what do you think about it? I think it's wonderful. I thank God. I thank God. Like I say, I think God had a lot to do with it. I didn't think so until recently I got to thinking. I got more religious. I got baptized. And uh, I thought about a lot of things that happened. I didn't think about it in the same way as I do now. I look back now, I know that we had to have, have help in this coincidence. I could tell you a couple of things, but... Uh, what, uh, what would you tell people watching this um, that they might not know, like about how gr great it was or good it was? Well, it, it was a business and it was for a full-time job. I mean, it, it was really a, a job, but 
I guess, I guess you could say that, no, sort of like we're coming out of Nashville in an old bus. I'll never forget this. There was a, a station wagon stopped, and we come around this little mountain. A station wagon stopped, and they had a bunch of kids in the back. Well, our bus didn't have brakes when it was raining. So here we come around this curve, and they're stopped right there in the road. And just so, so happened, the ditch was made for a bus to run into. And the guy driving laid our bus over in the ditch to keep him hitting those kids. And I think that was God. I think God had something to do with that. I, uh, you would have to be there and feel the, well, danger. And uh, these people were stopped. They were going to make a left turn, but they had to wait till these cars come by over here. So here we come around doing about 50 or 60, and they're right in their way, and we can't stop. So he lays it over in the ditch. That's one thing. I, well, there's other things too, but that's one of the things that I look back on. I, I thank God that we laid it over in the ditch. And it didn't bang up our bus, it didn't do nothing, it just laid it over and it did. We got a record to pull us out and went right on to the job. Why, um, do, you, why do you love country music? Mm -hmm. Why do I like country? Well, it's three chords and the truth. That's what they always say. Country music is three chords and the truth. I like country music because it's real. Everything else is songs, you know. I mean, if it's not real, it's not country. That's the way I feel about it. Um, I've wrote quite a few songs. I had number one song with Ray Price, Same Old Me, I, I wrote that. I had a Dear John Letter, I own that song. Um, uh, I have a song called uh, I'd Rather Be the One You Sleep Around With. That thing made the uh, number one or two, something like that. I've had a good success in writing, but Merle was great in writing. So I finally told him, I said, I'm going to quit writing. I can't compete with you. He just, we wasn't competing with each other, but I can't uh, compare, you know, Merle wrote some great songs. Mama Try, oh man. Are we headed downhill like a, something headed for hell, <laughs> you know. Uh, he wrote a lot of good songs, man. Uh, I would say uh, Oki Muskogee, Fugitive, uh, The Bottle Let Me Down, uh, so ringing doors, man, just right on down the line, you know. Why do you think he was so popular? Because he's good. He wasn't popular because of anything else. In other words, if he hadn't wrote three hits in a row, he wouldn't have been so popular. But I mean, you stop and think. Uh, swinging Doors, The Bottle Let Me Down, The Fugitive, that's three in a row, you know, Sing Me Back Home, uh, Mama Tried, I mean, he wrote so many good songs. Uh, you're running down our country, man, you're walking on the fighting side of me. That's a great song. In fact, we we did some some dates with the with the president when he's running. He only got that song, I think. Yeah. 
Yeah, are you hearing me okay? Yeah, he's got you. Um, some people think you're the last tie to that Bakersfield music. That I'm hot? You're the last tie to that Bakersfield sound. I'm the only one left just about. I got, man, I get to thinking, wow. All the people that's died, you know. You know how old I am? Eighty. That's young. Huh? That's young. Eighty-nine. I'll be ninety in about two months. Uh, I've been blessed. That's the reason I, I thank God for my longevity and everything. And my health has been good. Uh, I don't know if anybody cares about that, but I do. <laughs> you know. What um, when people say you're the last one? I am pretty much the last one. I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think. Willie Nelson is the only one really left. Um, you know, he had, he had some kind of an operation. He was in bad shape. We had dates booked with Willie, and we had to cancel two or three of them because he was in the hospital and getting the I forget what they called it, some kind of operation, New Deal, where they take the blood out of your body mm -hmm. and they put young blood back in it or something. I, I, there's a name for it, but I, I, I can't think of the name of it. But we had to wait, uh, we had to cancel two or three days. Willie is about, about the only one left. Is, you know? it, is it a time and a, and a kind of music we won't get back? Uh, we won't get it back. There ain't gonna be no one to take Merle's place. There ain't no gonna be no one to take Hank Williams' place, George Jones' place. Uh, I think we lived through an era of country music, and I don't think it'll ever be the same. I, that's my personal thinking on it. Uh, what was it like when Merle passed away? It was terrible. Uh, I would say if there is such a thing as a good thing that really happened was the fact that we knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. And he knew it was coming. In fact, he predicted he would die on his birthday, and he did. Ain't that something, you know? Uh, we just bought a new bus. He bought a new bus. He died on the front of that bus as where he passed away. He didn't want to go back into the dark house. He wanted out on the bus. Uh, yeah, it was sad, but he knew it was coming. Uh, he had an operation. He had lung cancer, you know, at one time. And they had to take a rib out just to get to it, to his lung, and they cut that out. Uh, but he didn't want to go through that chemo stuff. But, if, you know, actually, Merle was 79 years old, so it's not bad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. So overall, huh? overall, good life for you both. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, kind of a weird deal. He um, he went to, to a couple of hospitals, and he called me and uh, and Norm and said he had he had uh, what he got uh, COPD, uh, emphysema, and lung cancer. He said that's what I got. <laughs> You know, and he'd been, uh, he didn't want to go through that chemo business. I, I can't blame him, really. I really don't. If you know about chemo, and the reason I know about chemo is my wife went through it. She had cancer. It was terrible, really. It's just a slow death. That's all, you know. Mm -hmm. There's some people who makes it, but. Uh, most don't. She, no, 
She had ovarian cancer or something. What do you love about Bakersfield? What do I like about it? It's my home. <laughs> I've lived here since, uh, off and on since 1946, I guess, yeah. You know, when I first moved here, the population was like 85,000. Now it's 300 and something thousand. And like I say, the music business here was five nightclubs at one time, five days a week, and six and twice on Sunday. Think about that. That's a lot of people drinking and dancing and having a good time. And I don't know, I, I guess, <clears throat> I guess Bakersfield, it's what you get used to, you know. Uh, like Merle moved from here to Reddy and bought a ranch up there. And the, re the main reason he did that was on kind of Lake Shasta. Uh, we spent a lot of time on the creek, on the lake and the creek. The creek runs into it there. Was he your friend? Huh? Was he your, your good friend? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were friends. I've never had a contract one more. It's just handshake or whatever we say we do, that's what we do, you know. Uh, people can't understand that. But it works both ways, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't against a contract. I just didn't see no use for one. I mean, that's that's pretty friendly, I think. You know, you got a pretty good idea of who your friends are that way. Merle was a pretty loyal, loyal guy, you know. It's like I'm telling him not to sign. If he'd have signed, the whole thing would have been, the whole, my whole life would have been gone. But he didn't, and that's what makes a good friend. He uh, he uh, bought a new, I don't know if you want to hear that or not, he bought a new bass boat and gave me his old bass boat. And then about six months ago, I gave it back to him. I gave him back his, the boat. His son wanted a bass boat. I said, I'll give you this one. You gave it to me, so I'll give it back to you. So, quite a deal. All right, I think we're good. We're gonna we're we're done with your interview. Huh? We're done with your interview. You're good. Are you done? We're done. Okay. Um, but do you have some pictures of Merle around here and you? <laughs>